singing in the trees And for a moment you're distracted From all those bitter memories Well I hope our love ain't like the snow Temporary, soon to go Fleeting beauty till the sun or rain Comes to beat it down the drain Hi everyone and welcome to this week's Artist Spotlight. Um, today we are very excited to have Dan Wild on, who is an English singer-songwriter uh, from Blackpool originally, but he lives in Cambridge and he's released two fantastic albums and quite a lot of uh, radio play and has always been someone that I've admired as a songwriter and a guitar player, so it's really exciting for me to have him on the show to chat a bit more about those things in detail. Uh, so hi Dan. <laughs> Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good, good. How's things over there with you? Yeah, all fine. A bit of a weird time with the lockdown, but um, apart from that, I mean, it, you know, one good thing as a guitar player is it gives you plenty of time to practice, which is good. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm finding that a lot with students. I have online, they're just, yeah, a lot more focused on these things because they're just like, oh, I've got nothing else to do. So Yeah. So yeah, Dan, um, I guess I kind of want to dig in a little bit into the details of your guitar playing and and where you've come from on that sense. I have a little bit of an idea, but I have no idea on the specific details. And I'm yep. interested to hear how you started. Was it guitar you started with and how that can, it came about in the original sense? Sure. Um, so I actually started on the clarinet when I was at, um, mm. at primary school. And mm. I played that um, for quite a few years. I think I probably started, I started young, like six or seven. Um, I played it until I got to high school, so I was about 11, um, and uh, I got in the kind of high school band, and uh, I just remember walking, I was walking home one day with my little kind of clarinet box, and uh, there was an older lad that sort of <laughs> said, what's in that little black box? And I said, oh, it's a, it's a clarinet, and he, he kind of laid into me, and uh, oh. he was like, oh, that's not cool, you want to mm. play guitar or drums or something, and it had quite a big effect on me, I just sort of went home thinking, oh. It's not cool to play the clarinet, so oh. um, it's a shame. <laughs> you know, I wish I'd carried on, but at the same time, it was um, it was something that it didn't make me pick up the guitar, but it, it made me not want to play the clarinet because um, at that age, I think you're kind of a bit more concerned about you know being cool. Um, so I I said to my parents, I don't want to play the clarinet anymore. They were really upset about it because. Um, you know the whole kind of oh if there's one thing i regret it's not playing an instrument so mm -hmm. i i made a deal with them basically that i would i would play play the guitar because we had one um lying around in the house my sister had played for a while and so we had that so that was the deal and that's kind of how i got started and uh yeah didn't really ever look back that age 11 i mean it's similar to when i started but um were you focused on being like a rock guy was it acoustic what kind of things were you looking at from the start what was enticing your kind of appetite yeah it was all kind of rock stuff really it was mm -hmm. it was um nirvana green day foo fighters yeah that kind of stuff to begin with um yeah and then i kind of got into the chili peppers um as well they, they were quite a big influence and john frusciante as a as a guitar player uh yeah i mean that's kind of where it, where it all started that kind of stuff um then through that i kind of got more into like classic rock stuff the you know last years of school and college mm -hmm. sort of 17 18 that kind of age so i got really into like led zeppelin and hendrix and pink floyd all that sort of stuff yeah that was kind of a natural progression isn't it you kind of start with the stuff that you think is going to make you you fit in kind of thing <laughs> especially if you've got a guy bullying you for playing the clarinet <laughs> and you just um yeah and then you move on to stuff that's a bit more you know guitar-y I guess sure yeah I mean um, I think that was that was like I say that was kind of that guy you know was part of the reason why I gave up the clarinet but at the same time I was getting into like I had an older brother and he was listening to a lot more like grungy stuff right okay and um, that had quite a big influence on me and I could obviously you can't you know you can't play Smells Like Teen Spirit on a clarinet not really well you can <laughs> But, <laughs> you know, it's not really suited to that that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't that I, I chose that kind of music to fit in. It was it was that was kind of what I was into. I guess that was what gave me the, the push to to sort of switch. 
Yeah, no, and it's cool that you had that kind of older brother influence to to drive you into that scene. I guess that helped you transition a bit. Um, yeah. Did you have any formal training at that age, or were you just kind of winging it using the internet? Was that I can't remember. Uh, yeah, thing, I mean, to begin with, um, no internet. You know, I don't. I don't think we had the internet. We didn't know for a while. while did we? Quite a while ago. <laughs> um, so I, I started with. You might know the book. It's um. It's called the Complete Guitar Player. And it starts with, um, yeah. there's just like a load of, it shows you that there's chord diagrams and then there's just like down up kind of arrows to tell you <laughs> how to strum. And um, yeah, I learned a load of a load of that stuff by myself without any lessons. Um, and I probably played, I don't think I had any lessons till I was about 14. Mm -hmm. um, my, my parents had paid for clarinet lessons for years and then I just quit. So they were um, not that keen to... They, they basically said, you know, prove that you're going to stick it and then we'll get you some lessons. Um, so, yeah, about age 14, I started have, having some lessons and the guy that I started having lessons with was a bit more of a folky. So he kind of got me into some like finger picking and uh, folkier sort of stuff. Yeah, which is more where you've moved to now as a songwriter, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So do you, do you ever, I was under, do you ever pick up the electric guitar in a writing sense or are you more like just adding touches to your songs is it that kind of thing or do you just you know turn the volume up crank it away and do that occasionally what, what? yeah no i do i mean I, I play electric guitar all the time um okay i'd say i write more on acoustic um mm -hmm. there's um the new stuff that i'm working on there's a few songs where i've started with like a riff um i wanted to kind of change things up a bit in the way that i write music so i've there's some that i've I've come up with like a drum part first and then and then written to that and some electric guitar part first and yeah just to kind of get some different sounds um and and a different kind of jumping off point in terms of songwriting I play quite That's a bit cool. of like jazzy sort of stuff but you did did you do jazz guitar formally was that like an education you did yeah so I did um I did a course in London which was um at the Guitar Institute which was just like contemporary guitar playing um right. and uh for the the first kind of I think there were four terms the first um three were like rock blues um country and like for those first three terms, I felt like I was a good guitar player and I knew what I was doing and I could everything they everything they gave me I could kind of I could manage it, you know, with a bit sure. of practice. And then in the last term we got to the jazz thing and, you know, they were giving us giant steps and all these kind of songs with insane chord progressions where you're changing key, you know, every yeah. sometimes, you know, like after two beats. You mm -hmm. know, so when it got to that I just felt like an absolute idiot just didn't really feel like i knew what i was doing so um and i was into jazz as well i was listening to it quite a lot um and uh so i decided that if i was going to kind of carry on studying music i'd go and study something that i really found hard um and that kind of that that's what sort of took me down the jazz route that is a wake-up call i think when you switch that because you hit a point don't you where you're like hmm yeah, I should really learn more. And then it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because you just end up going, oh God, I know, I know nothing. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I thought I knew everything and then now I'm diving into jazz and it, but then it just, I don't know, doing that gives you such a holistic appreciation for the instrument. It just yeah, makes you totally. have to dive yeah. in into any aspect. And do you use that kind of theory and that playing in your songwriting now? Is that something you go to or? Mm, not so much. Um... I think it's more of a folk sound, isn't it? You kind of yeah, because I mean, I've tried it. I've tried writing songs with like jazzy chord progressions, and they just sort of don't really suit. I don't know. They don't seem to fit that well. What mm -hmm. with the other stuff that I do, it, it has that sound that's hard to get away from if yeah. you're not wanting that feel. It's a language, isn't it? And it's yeah, yeah it's it sounds odd if you just chuck one language, <laughs> you know. <laughs> in the middle of a load of other stuff. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah. It's amusing that you still believe it's in your hands. There are pieces in the puzzle no one understands. They all fit in somehow. We just can't see it now.
So yeah, your recent, most recent album is Rhythm on the City Wall. That's, that's yep, the one, isn't that's it? That's right. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, I've listened to that over and over again. It's it's truly a great album. I mean, it's full of so yeah. many motifs and the little melodies, although maybe not too complicated to the guitar player. It's yeah. very well executed and links well to the lyrics and the melodies. And there's some great tracks on that. I mean, I could list endless ones from that album that I just, yeah, that they're fantastic. And uh, I just wanted to dig in some of the, the writing process for that specific album, because it seems yeah. like, you know, there's more of a basis in the guitar melody that's kind of enforcing the song. Okay, um, yeah. Do you have any tips as to how you go about that? Has that process evolved over the years or has it just come quite naturally to you to do that? It's not something I've like really thought about that much, to be honest. Um, I think my the style of writing has changed a bit in that when I first started writing um, songs, because before I was just, you know, I just played guitar and I played in bands and um, I basically started writing songs when I was, I was at university, I was doing that jazz degree degree and um i broke my hand and for a while i couldn't play the guitar um so i started writing lyrics and then when i came back to playing the guitar i had all these lyrics and mm -hmm. wanted to turn them into songs um but definitely at the beginning when i started writing songs because i was coming from a like i'm a guitar player kind of background the guitar parts although they're kind of acoustic guitar parts they're a lot more complicated um than the later stuff and that's because i was kind of starting with a guitar part that i thought was like a cool guitar part and then yep. building a song around that and then um i just realized that a lot of the stuff that i really liked listening to was not like that you know a lot of the mm -hmm. stuff i really liked was just someone strumming some chords and but the but the song was great the melody was great the lyrics were yep. great um so i guess i kind of went more towards that and occasionally I'll come up with something on the guitar and think, oh, I've got to write a song around that because it's cool. But more often than not, it starts with very simple, like me just strumming a few chords and then maybe I'll kind of embellish that a little bit. Yeah, because the, the storytelling on this album is is great. It's it's different from your first album. I can, I can definitely, now you've said that, it's, I can hear the difference between those two writing techniques that you've described and the the lyrics seem to be more of a focus on the, the Rhythm on the City Wall album. Um, sure. Especially like, you know, your Hammersmith Palais songs and they're, they're very relatable and take you back in your mind as to, to certain things you're writing about, which is what all songwriters kind of aspire to do. So you've done that really well. Um, so what's the story behind that particular song? What in your mind is it? Is it a relative of yours that? Yeah, yeah, it's, oh, my, okay. it's my grandma basically. Um, I'd go around there a lot. Like they, um, they lived in the same village I did growing up, and um, so they looked after me a lot. And my granddad was always telling stories about his when he was a kid, when he was in the navy. Like he was a great storyteller, but my grandma never really did. She was she'd just be sort of pottering away and <laughs> making cups of tea and things and yeah and then my, my grand my grandfather passed away and i realized i really didn't know that much about my my grandma's life I wanted to find out a bit more mm -hmm. um so I, I was kind of asking her about her upbringing and um but she was losing her memory and so she'd start stories and then forget how they ended right she told me about one thing she remembered was how she met my my grandfather and um she told me that she met him at the Hammersmith Palais and it was um, on a Wednesday night they had this thing called Ladies Night which was where the ex-service men would all get in for free and the women would choose who they wanted to dance with and she saw my grandfather dancing and he was a good dancer and so she went over and, and asked him for a dance and that was that. That's cool. You know, turn it into a great song that's so cool well it had to be you know when she yeah. told me that i was like okay if i don't write a song about that then you know that's amazing it's a cool tribute as well but like it works really well you've got like that melody over the background that just kind of reinforces but isn't isn't that stereotypical reinforcing the, the vocal melody it's kind of just complementing it nicely this kind of finger style you know du -dum, du -dum, it's kind sure, of it's, yeah. it, it's cool that you've gone through that and did did you obviously write the lyrics based off the story and then stick the guitar to it or did you have a guitar piece in mind that would go with that i th i think it was 
I had the idea for the song, then I came up with the guitar thing, and then I thought that'll suit that idea. It just sound, kind of sounded like that would work. Mm -hmm. And um, I think initially I had some ideas about having like some brass and kind of wartime kind of sounds. Um, mm -hmm. And then that, then when I recorded it, became strings and yeah. I think. Oh, the strings are cool on it. It's. And was that a live string recording thing? Or uh, there's a, like a, a friend thing? of mine, um, Richard, okay. uh, he's called Richard Curran, his name, and um, mm -hmm. he's great. He plays um, he plays all the strings. He's like a one-man string guy. Okay. So um, I just, I wrote I wrote a melody like a top line and then and then went over and we, we kind of arranged it together and put in some other parts and things. So it was all done in the studio? Yeah. So w in the studio... Um, because you're on your own a lot, but you do have other musicians playing. Mm, yeah. How does that work? Do you have like a pre-production kind of run up to it or do you send people the tracks and they just kind of go with it and you just kind of see what happens? What's the process for getting all those people involved? Sure. Yeah. That, I mean, that's changed. Definitely changed. Um, there's actually three albums. There's, um, huh. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> so you were saying about the first album, do you mean this is the play? It's like a green cover. Yes. Is that the yeah. one? So there's yeah. one. In the, there's one in the middle as well. Um, oh yeah, of course there is. Yeah, uh, with fire in mind. And um, yeah. the first yeah. album was produced with two of my friends, Gary Hall and Ian Bailey. That process was very much like uh, send the musicians the tracks and get them in the studio, and we'll mm -hmm. we'll figure it out. Uh, and it worked great. I mean, the the producer for that had a, he had a great team of players that all knew each other and played together and. Um, they were just used to that process, so it really worked well. Then the second one was kind of a bit more. Um, I had a I had a double bass player that I was playing with a lot, so we kind of we found a drummer and we kind of went and we were staying in this house in in Ireland, and basically recorded most of it there, and then I brought that back and kind of finished it off with some some other musicians, um, like session players, like for strings and. Mm -hmm. like vocals and bits of keyboard and stuff uh and then the the last one was um i was uh living in russia for a while um and didn't um have that much to do there so and i and I had a little i took a little universal audio apollo um and my initial idea was to make good demos and then bring them back and make an album in a studio but then uh, the demo started to sound decent, and I decided to just release that basically as a album. Cool. Uh, and I put some, I did get some, like a, like Richard, you know, on strings, and there were some overdubs and stuff. Mm -hmm. Most of it was just done, um, yeah, while I was in Russia. Now the approach is I'll basically make an arrangement and then send that to musicians, and hopefully they kind of bring something to it and it changes a little bit so that we're not just re-recording those demos basically that's cool that you've been through that transition to to do that to make up all those different albums and doing that all on your own kind of thing in russia remotely is well it's the way everyone works today now but that was a while ago that, that you were doing that so well i don't know much about you you don't tell me anything i've been knocking at your window you still won't let me in And I'll admit I quite enjoy the mystery You're shrouded in But I'm growing cold Okay, I want to get one thing out of the way, Dan, which is talking about what guitars you have. Um, oh, yeah. And, yeah, which ones do you go to? Which ones are the ones that you would save from a burning building? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's, let's nerd out on gear for a little bit. Sure, yeah. Um... Okay, I don't have that many guitars. I'm sorry to disappoint you. I've That's I've good. had I've had many. Um, I've had loads of different guitars, and there's some that I really wish I still had. <laughs> um, I'm thinking mostly about. I had like this dark kind of burgundy uh, Gibson three three five from Ooh. 1978. With I got rid of it. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> sorry, Gareth. <laughs> I, I know. It was so beautiful. That was kind of my main guitar when I was doing the jazz stuff. Mm. And then, um, I mean, I mentioned before about breaking my hand and I had to have plates put in there. 
And um, before that happened, I was I was able to like sit and practice for like four hours a day, you know, or more, you know, mm-hmm. or practice for that and then go to a rehearsal and that was fine. After that, ha- the injury with my hands and the plates were put in, um, I really couldn't sit there and practice for as long. Um, I still get little twinges occasionally. Um, and so I made, that was kind of part of the reason why I started writing more songs because uh, yeah. with, with the songs, it wasn't so much about the guitar playing, it was about the song. And so I sold some electric guitars basically is mm-hmm. what I'm getting to. And that was <laughs> one of them. And I wish I hadn't sold that, uh, but I did get a really nice acoustic. So uh, the two, my two main acoustics are made by Fylde Guitars. Oh, um, okay. Uh, I don't know if you know that company. Yeah, I've heard of Files. Yeah, not too familiar with the models, but I have played them before. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, they started in the Files, which is where we're both from, mm-hmm. um, and now they're made in Penrith. And um, because of the local connection, um, I was going to this folk club in Blackpool, and the guy that was doing the sound knew Roger Bucknell, who makes the guitar. Mm-hmm. And he um, told Roger that he should sort me out with a guitar. So <laughs> I was invited to go there and um, choose woods. And oh, wow. yeah, and it was all kind of, um, it was a sponsorship, not completely free, but like a lot, you know, less than. Good discount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really good discount. So um, my two main guitars are um, a filed Falstaff mm-hmm. and uh, a filed Aerial. Cool. I've heard of the Aerial. That yeah, rings a bell. It's a small, really small guitar, like almost kind of parlor size guitar. But it's uh, okay. Amazing. Projection is amazing. Like yeah, and, and for finger picking, you really you can be really gentle, and you get so much from it. Um, oh, where that's perfect. That's what you want from an acoustic. Like are they, are they electro as well, Dan. Both of them. Uh, well, I've got, I've got pickups in them, so uh, yeah. Yeah. I've got. Um, I think it's Mimesis Kudos. The uh, okay. really nice. It's the guy that um, he's called like Mike. I, I can't remember his name, Mike Fand or something or other. But he invented the um, the Fishman um, mm-hmm. sound hole pickups. Uh, yeah. or he was like one of the people that invented those. And so they're sound hole pickups uh, with microphones kind of built into them. But they sound mm. really amazing. No, no, cool. That's interesting. So, so you, you generally just stick to the acoustic then? You, you haven't got uh, any other electric? Sorry, I've got a Jazz, oh. a jazz Master as well. Oh, okay. Um, nice. Which I use... Uh, I really want to get a Telecaster um, at the moment. I love Telecasters. <laughs> yeah, I want to get a Thin Line one. I had one of those once as well, and it yeah. was one of those where, like, I was um, probably like nineteen, twenty, or something, and I had this Mexican uh, Thin Line Telecaster. Mm-hmm. And it might be that my memory is off, but. Uh, I swear it was like the nicest guitar that I've ever played in my life. Right. Why, why did I sell it? Because um, I wanted to get an American, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> an American <laughs> Telecaster because I just thought that it would be better. It's very easy to do that with gear, isn't it? You can yep. guitars and pedals and amps and all that sort of stuff. You kind of look at what your favorite players use and you look mm-hmm. at, and you, it's really easy to sort of think, ah, oh, you know what? The reason I can't play that is because I don't have that guitar. Right, yeah. and then you get that guitar, and you go, oh, "No, it really wasn't." But yeah. I don't have that guitar. I need that one. <laughs> and you just—it's really easy to. And the same with like I'm, I do a lot of recording now, and it's really easy to go down that route with that stuff as well. Like you need that microphone or that preamp, or you get lost in forums, don't you, and those sorts of things. Like yeah, in, people's opinions. Yeah, and I think just doing the thing is is I've like if I added up all the time that I've spent like researching gear mm-hmm. and I and I just had practiced <laughs> you yeah. know no you're right that's so true that's such a true comment it's uh, something I think about all the time it's it's unreal how much time you waste digging into unnecessary crap really yeah it's just yeah like you say buying guitars and I've I've kind of tried to stop doing that now it's just like I'm at a happy point now where I've got what I need and I'm, I'm good and but yeah no I was the same just reading yeah. oh yeah me too you, know, you, you kind of you re- you eventually after spending you know ridiculous amount of money yeah you eventually kind of go like ah it's not the you have to have good stuff right like to yeah. a le- to a certain level yeah. but then beyond that it's just what you do with it isn't it 
Oh, definitely, yeah. I, I've always loved that meme online that's like a musician crams like ten thousand pounds or dollars of gear into a two hundred dollar car or something. It's just right, so yeah. true. Yeah. It's just <laughs> this picture of this crappy car full of like gear that they bought. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, cool. I, I think that's enough gear for now. But yeah. Uh, I won't be losing any sleep tonight about the things I've done. Yeah, I'm abusing my position. Isn't everyone? Working this job is Moving on to guitar. So you, you do teach guitar. Um, I, mm-hmm. know that. I don't know how much you do that and what kind of stuff you do, but I know you've got a course coming out um, specifically mm-hmm. for kids. Yeah. Uh, we'll get onto that in a second, but I just wanted to dig into the kind of teaching aspect and see what kind of pitfalls you see people coming across and how you tend to correct them. I'm not, you know, it's, it's a very broad topic, but the most common things that come to mind in terms of when you get someone that's maybe been playing for a little bit with online mm-hmm. lessons or, and there's things that you think, oh, that's not what you should do and, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, the, by far the most common thing is just people coming at, when they've been playing for a while themselves and even a lot of the time when they've had lessons, they come in for the first lesson and you get them to play something and like the amount of times you ask someone to play something and they play something that's really half-baked mm-hmm. and um, it's because they haven't taken the right approach to learning it. Like, So the most common thing is that people, they want to play the song at the full speed or close to the full speed like straight away and so um, my approach always when I'm teaching is just like telling people to slow down use a metronome and break things down into tiny tiny little bits so you know don't worry about the full phrase get those first two notes right now add the third note like literally like step by step and super slowly because you're trying to build the muscle memory and If you do it slowly and get it right a bunch of times, that muscle memory has a chance. Whereas if you do it fast, if you play quickly, you make mistakes and you keep making the same mistakes, your muscle memory starts to work against you and you learn the mistakes. So that's that's it. You know, that is... (laughs) When I was... That's the code, isn't it? That's the code for playing well. It's just time after time. I I appreciate that so much that people just want to play at speed. Far mm-hmm. too soon. And and hearing someone play something really simple really well is always going to beat hearing someone play something really complicated and badly. Um, yeah. I remember going to when I went to this uh, the guitar school in in London. Um, I remember sitting there on my first day and watching this guy opposite me. Uh, he was doing like eight finger tapping. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was insane. What is I was that? Watching, I was like, <laughs> He had all eight. He had all eight fingers on the fretboard, what? and he and it was mm. just like and they were go. They were all over the place. Mm. I was just watching him, thinking, "Wow, he's incredible! Like he must be like a master student or something." Yeah. And then I asked him, and he was like, "Oh no, I'm on the same course as you." Okay. And I was like, "Oh my god! Like I'm going to be mm. um, surrounded by all. Yeah, I'm going to be surrounded yeah. by all these like monster guitar players." Yeah. And then. Um, And then it got to, I mean, to be fair to him, like he could do it and he could do it Mm -hmm. well. Um, Mm -hmm. But, but it got to like just playing like really basic stuff, chords. He Mm -hmm. couldn't do, he couldn't play chords. Uh He couldn't play open chords. He'd just gone straight Mm -hmm. to, I don't know how, but he'd just gone straight to eight finger tapping. Um, (laughs) As you do. And like I say, to be fair, he could do it. So that was, Mm -hmm. um, you know, that every credit to him for like working on that and getting that right. It's not what it's all about though, Uh, is it? Yeah. You gotta be able to do the simple stuff yeah. too. And um and I think yeah, just slowing things down and getting things right is it's gonna sound better like hearing someone play something well than hearing someone play something really complicated and not that well. And especially nowadays there's not really any excuse to not do that because you there's all sorts of things out there to help you slow things down and play at slower yeah. speeds and uh, I mean I think even YouTube lets you do it now and uh uh, there's all sorts of free tablature software out there, you know, Guitar Pro Tabs is something I use a lot for students, is just getting them to play along at like half, quarter speed and just, until you've mastered this section at this speed, you're not moving on to the next bit. It's yeah. just, you just have to be like that. And uh, and I guess going back to the eight finger tapping, I don't know, in my mind, who who kind of wants to listen to that, you know, as a general kind of 
rule. It's very much a guitar player niche. Yeah, there's that. Um, I remember. I remember one of the tutors uh, actually commented about it um, because we were playing a song. Um, I think it was like a classic rock thing or something, some Deep Purple thing or something. Mm. We'd have these live performance workshops every week, where yeah. you'd get people. It was a school, and there were people studying guitar, people studying bass, people studying singing, drums. And once a week, you'd kind of come together, and there would everybody would learn a song, and you'd have to get up on stage with a band that you'd not played with before and play the song. And if everyone knew their parts, it was great. Yeah. Um, and we were doing this like Deep Purple thing, and it got to this guy was called. Uh, I'm going to call him Dario. He wasn't called Dario, but it was close. I just don't. I mean. <laughs> Not that, you know, it'd be a miracle if he was kind of, if he, if this got back to him. But anyway. Right, okay. um, just to be safe. Yeah, just to be safe, we'll call him Dario. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he got to his solo in a Deep Purple song and just all, he had this like little like dampener that he put down at the end, like near the nut. And that mm. like went down and he did this eight finger tapping solo. <laughs> A deep my a deep for a deep purple song completely inappropriate <laughs> and my uh my tutor sort of i was sat next to him who was you know not afraid to speak his mind he he mm -hmm. said to me um why does a dog look its own bollocks <laughs> and uh i was like i don't know and he's like because it can <laughs> and uh i've always i've always enjoyed that um yeah yeah that's good yeah <laughs> can, can can that stay on the podcast i don't know no, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's no rules here. Right. Being a rural lad from Lancashire, anything okay. goes. Um, yeah, so let's talk about your course because it's quite sure. exciting. It's something I've been meaning to do for a long time, but then just decided not to do it. So I'm quite mm -hmm. excited to hear about it because it's something the world needs. So let's let's talk about your course that's coming out, Dan. Cool. Um, so it's called uh, Teach Your Child Guitar. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, uh, we were talking about this before um, before that we started the podcast. Yep. Um, how, um, as a guitar teacher, if you have young students and they come with their parents, they always seem to do much better because if the mm -hmm. parents like take an interest and they understand what they need to practice, then they can help them. Yep. Um, I was teaching in schools, and so many times I'd have. Uh, a student come in and you'd say, oh, do you practice this week? And they'd say, oh, I forgot what I had to mm. do. And you'd say, well, you know, have you got the sheet that I gave you? Oh, no, I lost it. <laughs> so getting the parents involved really, really helps because they can help them out and, um, mm. you know, slow them down. That's that's one of the things. Um, I feel like most of the time when I'm teaching guitar, I spend half the lesson just going, okay, let's do that again, but slower. Yeah. Like, let's put the metronome on, let's break it down. So the course is basically teaching parents to sit there and go, slow it down, <laughs> break it up, you know, let's just do that section. So there are video lessons for the for the kids mm -hmm. uh, with PDFs and stuff. And then video lessons for the parents to tell them what to look out for, for that specific lesson and how to help them learn that specific tune or, you know, the string names or whatever I mean that's really useful I think uh, I mean it will take off I'm sure this is especially now I mean requests for kids getting lessons and with them being at home surely that's going to be more prevalent now sure um, yeah I, I hope so I mean I hope it I hope it work it's not um, the idea wasn't to like replace guitar lessons yeah. I don't think mm -hmm. you can ever really like having guitar lessons one on one yeah. with a person in the same room it's really valuable um, but my sister has two twin boys. Um, they're like six years old. One of them really wants to learn guitar. The other mm -hmm. one isn't that interested, but they're called Jack and Jamie, right? So if Jack yeah. learns the guitar, then Jamie wants to learn too because sure. they're twins and they like to do the same stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so my sister was like, it's going to cost me like 40 pounds a week to get them yeah. both, both guitar lessons. And so that was like the initial thing that sparked the idea. I was like, I bet I could do a video to, te you know, I bet I could do like videos to teach them. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, well, maybe there are other parents in the same situation where they, they don't want to like not give their child the opportunity, but it's quite a big commitment to spend, you know, 20 quid a week on a lesson if they're not going to stick at it. Because at that age, kid, kids kind of pick things up and drop them 
all the time. Yeah, as you described at the start of the interview, yeah. And so exactly. yeah. The I think, yeah, budget comes into it a lot because not everyone can afford it. I mean, it's ideal to have a guitar lesson every week, but yep. it's it's not it's not cheap to do that, to get that. I mean, sometimes I recommend people that aren't able to afford a weekly lesson, just do a monthly or a two month kind of check in on what they're doing and just give them content for a bit longer. But uh, it's hard, but I think the online course is is never going to go away. And I think for kids, it's like you say, it needs to be cheaper because if you've got like this scenario with twins or whatever, it's it's a big expense for someone yeah. to, to potentially not really use it properly. And it, it's a good idea because then the, the kids and the parents get to at least taste it and see if the kids have got the appetite for it. I yeah, think it's it's always going to be around. But so do you have specific details of where we can get that course done? What, how do we find it? Is it um, already? So I've just today I released like an early access version mm -hmm. of it so okay. I've got like 20 people signed up to that nice. they're, they're trying it out give me feedback and then mm -hmm. I've basically done um, the first three units and then I'm going to get feedback on those first three units and then possibly re-record some of it mm -hmm. uh, if, if I get suggestions for how things could be improved or if things sure. could be made clearer mm -hmm. um, there is a website but it's not um, fully it's only kind of available for people that have um, signed up for the early access. So if you go to it at the moment, um, it will just sort of say coming soon. But okay. if people wanted to email me, um, it's uh, teachyourchildsguitar at gmail.com. Okay, so cool. If, if anyone's works, okay. interested in signing up, then they can get in touch and can probably sort them out with a, like a trial. Yeah, well, I haven't checked it out, but knowing the way you play down and the way you've been teaching for years so it's definitely something people should check out it's uh thanks dan it's, yeah no it's cool that you're doing a little early access to get feedback i think that's going to make it even better probably yeah hopefully um, so are you planning to develop that to quite an extensive course then is that the plan or just kind of do it as a kind of beginner's intro course or yeah it depends i i, I suppose it depends how, how it people goes, get on with it because i yeah. i feel like um i mean like I was saying before, when I started playing guitar, I, I learned a lot on my own with a book. Mm -hmm. um, and so I feel like it can be done. You know, I feel like with with enough help, yep. it can definitely be done, you know. So I'm hoping that people will find it useful and that it will work for them. And if it works and, and it works for lots of people, then it'd be foolish not to keep it going and continue kind of making content for it so we'll just see how it goes yeah i think that's the way to do it i think it's uh no it's cool very exciting for you dan very cool yeah very cool. yeah well done. Cool. if your history's too heavy you should leave it all behind you know it's nothing but a story weighing heavy on your mind and it's no more real than that how long are you gonna keep so Dan, I just wanted to move on to a bit more about, uh, I know you work with musicians to actually record them and have been there in a kind of producer element. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you been doing that and why did that start? Was that just to get involved in the local scene or, or what, what, what brought that about? I've been recording music since like I was at college um, in Blackpool. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, that was kind of where it started. In fact, even before, like at school, I had like a Tascam tape recorder. Right. Um, so I've kind of always had some kind of rec recording set up and um, I made the first kind of two albums and then for the third one like I say I was in Russia so I uh, initially just thinking demos and then decided to make it just make the album basically so mm -hmm. after that um, I got some quite kind of good radio play for one of the songs yep. and then some um, people um, from Cambridge asked me if I could help them and that sort of came off the back of that really so I started helping them record stuff and just sort of went from there really um, I love doing it so it you know every time someone asked me I'd say yes and um, just it just became a full time thing quite um, organically really So what kind of bands and artists do you involve in? Is it similar to your style or has it been a bit of everything? Yeah, it tends to be similar to my my stuff. Okay. I mean, I've worked with I've worked with some people who aren't similar to me at all. Um, but generally, the people that find me are people that do 
similar stuff and like are mm-hmm. on the same sort of scene so it's yeah. like acoustic singer songwriters a few bands but they're sort of like leaning towards acoustic kind of indie sort of stuff yeah. um but i have i've worked with the, like a few rappers and things like that but generally like those guys look for someone that does that yeah um a lot of the time it's people that don't have a band so they want to make an album that sounds like they have a band but they don't have a band so they'll mm. come here and we'll kind of spend usually a day just kind of getting ideas down for the arrangement so we'll mm-hmm. program drums and program stuff and play play guitars and a few other things like banjos and mandolins and things like that and uh get an arrangement together and then d- it all depends on budget sometimes that kind of that is enough like because the mm-hmm. program drums now they sound you can make them sound so good oh yeah, yeah. um and and as the same with a lot of programmed instruments so sometimes that's the end of the process and then i mix it and then it's done and sometimes we'll kind of swap out all those uh, you know, like the the program drums, I'll get a real drummer in, and and I'll send him the the tracks, so uh, can listen and get an idea for the song. Hopefully, bring some of his his or her own creativity to it, and then um, re-record bits. Does that help you as a personal kind of songwriter as as your as your process evolved because you've been helping other people? Has that made you, you know, like when you learn stuff? The, to share and help other people has it helped your process at all yeah i think i think so in terms of arranging it's definitely mm-hmm. helped are you quite critical when you arrange things or is everything quite organic do you just kind of let it happen and flow out naturally or do you kind of go ooh, don't like that and work on things like more meticulously to it, yeah to, it's to perfect them it tends to be both um mm-hmm. i think at the beginning i just i really just want to get ideas down mm-hmm. and then as it as it sort of goes on then you need to be then you need to start being more critical so it's fine at the beginning to just chuck ideas at it yeah. and then but then at some point you have to organize those ideas and say okay well if we're going to have that we can't have that because those two things fight each other a little bit in the mix or mm-hmm. yeah I, I like to keep things moving so if if i'm working with someone and they have an idea i'll always say like yeah let's let's get it down it, mm-hmm. even if i think it's maybe not going to work we'll, we'll get it down yeah. And then we'll kind of come back to it and decide, make those make those decisions before it comes to mixing. Like I don't like to have loads of decisions to make when it gets to mixing. So between between the two of us, or me and the band, or whatever, we'll get the arrangement finished. Um, and that often involves taking a few things out, and maybe you you know. It's, it's very easy now to sort of do something in the first chorus and then copy and paste it to the second chorus. So a lot mm-hmm. of arrangements you find that and I quite like to make things not the same, you know, like take things out. So if that's in the first chorus, maybe that element is not in the second chorus, something else comes in there instead. Um, yeah, it's so easy to do that nowadays is to, to copy paste. And I've been in, in like studios with engineers and they've just done that without even talking yeah. to you you know it's just like right well that chorus is done we'll do the other chorus it's like what what whereas i'm like you it's like it, i like to make every element at least slightly different to keep the interest going so yeah and the same with that. vocals like i have vocalists all the time um mm-hmm. they'll do the they'll do the first chorus and then they'll just be like yeah you can just copy and paste that to the other <laughs> and you can do Not that here, you it's, can't do. It's, it's fine but it's it's nice if you can get something a little bit different yeah. each for yeah. each one no, it makes a difference. I think that that makes the track so much more interesting to listen to. I just mm-hmm. find that's one of the problems with music nowadays, not going down on a rant here, but it's just, it's so easy to do it. But I think those people that break the pattern and, and do that just are rewarded by having something better to listen to. Even if it doesn't make like mainstream radio or anything, it's just, you're more proud of it at the end of the day. You can know that you made more of an effort than just going, mm-hmm. oh, I sang that chorus and just copied it. I mean, well, you know. I don't, yeah. I don't like doing that and the whole yeah. autotune argument does that ever come up do you have to bring people back to more of a like an organic way of doing things is, it seems like more of your way yeah um, that is my preferred way but sometimes yeah. sometimes you need Melodyne <laughs> yes yes true yes uh, your name's uh, going on this at the end of the day I guess yeah sorry I said if your name's going on as a producer you don't want it to be you know awful but yeah, I mean, it's 
it's one of those there are people that actually want that so they'll they'll mm -hmm. um they'll sing and then they'll come in straight away and say oh let's like can we tune that bit can we tune that bit and they're mm -hmm. like then there are other people that will be like super offended if you even like you know oh right okay yeah so um gotta be careful and then and then you know and then there are times when it's appropriate and times when it's not appropriate too mm -hmm. so stylistically depending on who you're working with um so i'll use it when it's needed and when people are happy for me to use it and i'll not use it especially in like the rap scene i know you don't do that too much but that's very heavily auto-tuned as a stylistic thing sure yeah um i found that worked in a couple of uh like rapper albums over here and it's it's definitely more of a thing um they kind of expect it in their sound yeah um, it's not just a correction but more of an effect a lot of yes, the time exactly yeah um because when it when auto-tune sort of first came out it was like people were doing it but they didn't want anyone to notice they were doing it yeah and then um i don't know if like that share do you do you believe that that song believe by share i don't know if that was like <laughs> yeah. it wasn't the first mm. one but it was it like was an early one it was an early one that was really super obvious and everyone kind of went oh what's that you know and that was like yeah. one where people maybe thought ah we can use auto-tune and make it like part of what yeah. makes this track stand out i can't think of an earlier song to be honest i mean there was kind of the whole vocoder kind of that mm. sort of sound but it, it wasn't that kind of obvious pitch discrete pitch shifting kind of sound i think that was the yeah. first one i remember anyway of yeah it happening but i think that was when it became acceptable that kind mm. of track yeah. coming out yeah so that kind of brings us to the end really dan it's been great to take up your time to if that's the right way of saying it to to introduce people to your music and your kind of guitar courses and, and the way you go about things it's interesting for me to hear on a personal level because we've kind of known each other for a while but never dug into the specifics so sure. it's, it's quite yeah. interesting to, to hear your process and how you've developed um, and we played together more when we were a lot younger so this time in the in the intermediate time it's it's nice to hear what you've been up to and I'm excited to hear new stuff, but I know you're working on it in the background and your main focus has been on the kind of course stuff recently on this kind of crazy lockdown period. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, excited to hear that when it's ready and uh, it'd be great to see some maybe documentaries type stuff of seeing you go through your process. I think that'd be really cool for people. Yeah, to that's something I've to. yeah thought about as well. Doing a Yeah, definitely do, do that. I think it, I think it's the way the world's going, documenting mm -hmm. all this sort of stuff, and yeah. especially with all these things, you can pull your production, your recording elements. It's yeah, I think it'd be really cool for everyone to know the mm -hmm. process behind what you're up to. But what is a kind of a, an introduction to the new album? Is there any kind of theme you might go for, or is it kind of very much up in the air at the moment? Um, yeah, there's not like any one theme for it. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's going to be different. I mean, that's because I've done three. Mm -hmm. I really want to make this one different <laughs> and it'll be more like electronic type stuff that tends to be the way people go if they've kind of done acoustic for a while um, they throw other stuff in but there'll probably be a little bit of that um mm -hmm. i work with this guy who um he's really into like 80s stuff yeah. and um it's it's been a lot of fun working with him because often there are certain sounds that you just kind of like oh no you, you know you <laughs> you try them out and you're like oh no it's super cheesy it's so 80s or whatever well yep he's like yeah i love it let's get it you know he's like <laughs> so I, it's kind of i've really i'm not saying i'm gonna make an album that's 80s sounding but what i am saying is that, <laughs> that would be amazing but yeah. what i really enjoy about working with him is like he's not um he's never concerned he never wants to do like the safe thing he's always like yeah let's like that sounds ridiculous let's put it on the track yeah and um it's been quite it's been a lot of fun working with him and i'm trying to bring that kind of like sense of i'm having fun in the studio to my own stuff rather than i'm oh it's really serious and i have to make something that's you know i think yeah just having fun and so i think that's that is kind of coming out in the arrangements i've i'm working on demos and stuff and i think that there's more of a sense of me having fun i think that's cool the... that sounds exciting to be honest i think that's something that you kind of lose sometimes as a songwriter and a recording artist you mm -hmm. you're very much focused on the sound you've developed and switching it up is hard like they always say the difficult second album but you've got three under your belt but that's cool that you found that person maybe that's the the thing that's going to make this one completely different which you know 
we'll, we'll wait to see what that is but mm -hmm. um it's been great to have you on dan uh, yeah, appreciate your time me. and uh yeah we're gonna have dan's track we did mention it before uh, the hammersmith palais inspired by his uh, grandma and granddad meeting uh and how they met so it's cool have a listen check out dan's music as well it's uh, danwild.net and uh yeah great amazing uh i really i really appreciate your time uh, dan and uh yeah thanks thanks for coming on cool thanks thanks for having me dan cheers no problem Brand new demob suit with broke green taming every curl And moves out on the floor to melt the hearts of pretty girls She'd been working hard at home while the men were all away And dancing with her sister at the Hammersmith Palais But now the war was over, perhaps an answer to her prayers There was hope in every heart amidst the music in the air And all the ladies Servicemen don't pay Come pick your man And dance the night away The Hammersmith Palace Thought that man can dance If he thinks he'll take me home tonight He hasn't got a chance So she floated across the dance floor But before she'd said a thing He took her by the hand Just as the band began to swing An old ladies night every Wednesday The servicemen don't pay Come pick your man Smith Pile well, The dance took close in time And when the night came to an end He kissed her on the hand And said I hope I'll be here next Wednesday If you care to come along The Harry Roy band's playing And they play my favorite song And on ladies night Every Wednesday The servicemen don't pay Come pick your man And dance the night away The Hammersmith Palace